Last session of the day, I'm really pleased to be here moderating this panel on AI and ePortfolios. And um, we have three wonderful speakers here who I'm going to grill with a bunch of questions. And they're going to share some perspectives from their different positionalities about AI and portfolios. So uh, it'll be not me talking very much and mostly them. And I'm going to uh, give them a few quick moments to introduce themselves. So Eliana, do you mind starting? Hi, everyone. I'm Eliana El Khoury. I am from Athabasca University. I'm an assistant professor, and I research alternative assessment. Alternative assessment, different disciplines, equity and alternative assessment. How does it look like? What do the students feel about it? I am really passionate about alternative assessment, and you will notice that. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Lisa Gray. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of PebblePad, but for the last 20 years, I've spent time working with an organization in the UK called JISC, who work with all universities um, across the UK to enhance their use of technology-enhanced learning. So as part of that, um, ran, uh, well, back in the early 2000s, I was the ePortfolio lead. So we developed some early guidance, guidance around effective practice, around ePortfolio implementation, and then I then went on to manage some progr innovation programs around assessment and feedback, around employability and future readiness, around digital skills and around curriculum design. So hoping to bring some of those perspectives, really. But I think for me, my main provocation is to suggest that we have an opportunity to enable others, help others think about maybe something we should have been doing anyway. What are our assessment practices looking like? And are they preparing students for future success? So that's the perspective I'll be sharing with you today. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Kelly. And before today, I would say I'm not the type of person to throw stones. at, But apparently, <laughs> Shane inspired me. Uh, it took me a long time in life to realize that I should actually be in education, but a lot of other people realized it before I did. When I was in uh, grade school, a parent in my carpool said, hey, my son, he's a couple years behind you. He's not doing well in math. Can you help him? You're getting an A. And so my first question to the son was, what do you like? And he said, I like sports. And so we started with the multiple nine for the multiplication tables, and we found there's nine baseball players and nine innings in a game and all these things. And so I found out much later in life that there are strategies that we can use, like finding what's meaningful to the learner so that they can remember what they're doing and convey that back in a way that's meaningful. And so that's the spirit that I try to bring in my own class, how to learn with your mobile device, where students learn how to learn, how to improve their learning, and how to use technology to implement the process. And so for some reason, I'm on this panel, and I think I'm more for comic relief because these two are amazing, and I, I hope to keep up. Thanks, everyone. Well, we have a series of questions, and I'll be asking the panelists for their thoughts, and they'll be weighing in in turn. And uh, I've got my trusted uh, um, expert over there monitoring time who will keep us on track. So the first question that we have for the panelists are, what are the challenges higher education is facing? How might AI and ePortfolios be implicated in these challenges? And Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you to start. I think one of the biggest challenges is this artificial intelligence has been around, as I mentioned yesterday, since the 50s, right? And, but it's only become a big thing. Most people have become aware of it and what it its impact on education in the last, let's say, year. And so it's like this dragon has been sitting in the middle of the room, or maybe elephant, pick a large object. And uh, we're only becoming aware of it. And so I think the challenge is, now what do we do? Do we run away? Do we fight it? Do we ask it for advice? And so that's where we are right now. The challenge for us as educators when it comes to how do we help our students is wanting our students to submit original work, do that work themselves, but also have the ability to utilize AI and other technologies to support themselves in becoming better learners. 
as digital literacy tools and so on. So um, as we look at what the challenges are, it's not necessarily AI per se, it's how we engage learners in the learning process and make sure that they know that they're, it's not a transaction, it's a transformation as some of the speakers have been saying all along this week. So very much agree with Kevin. I think the, the challenge question is that our traditional assessment practices aren't always best preparing learners for success. So again, just taking it above the AI challenge really to see, um, you know, how can we encourage others to really think about and interrogate their assessment strategies. But um, back in JISC, I think around 2012, we did a landscape survey, which just assessed the sort of assessment landscape in the UK. And some of the things that were coming through were that traditional practices were still dominating. Uh, they were inconsistent. There was a lack of development focus with very much an assessment of rather than for or as learning approaches. Um, feedback was very problematic. So in terms of the consistency, the timeliness, the quality of feedback. So learners were seen very much in a passive role rather than active players. Um, and I think as Tracy, you were talking about earlier in the conference, these practices are really resistant to change. So it's just reminding ourselves that, that the AI challenge is just part of something that we have been thinking about for a long time and I think have a lot to offer in that space. Um, and before the pandemic, we well, during the pandemic, we saw a move to some alternative assessment approaches. Um, and some of those were proven to be more inclusive, um, but yet there's this desire to almost go back at the moment to some of those more traditional practices. So it's, it's, it's how we can make the most of the moment to try and help all faculty and all staff think about how we can do things better and not just not learn from what we learned during that experience. Okay. I'm just going to say one idea. For me, the challenge is why. Why is this a challenge? Why are my students using AI and not being engaged in the assessment? And this goes back to what Shane was saying. It's a lack of confidence in the assessment. They're not engaged. They, are, they don't want to learn. They don't want to portray their learning this way. So if we think about the why and we go one step higher and with our assessment design and we see what can we do with our assessment to address that why. Great, thank you. So what are the benefits emerging from the use of AI in education and how might these impact ePortfolio pedagogies, practices, and research? Lisa, I'll go to you first. Uh, well, just to start us off on that very thorny topic, um, I think there are, as we've all seen, there are many reported um, potential benefits um, of, of AI for supporting students around revision spaces, around helping them clarify um, tasks, helping them uh, develop some foundational knowledge perhaps outside a classroom so that in class we can make better use of the time, um, but also opportunities around feedback. And I was listening to a, a, a podcast uh, from an autistic research student who was just saying how valuable she's finding it for assisting her almost as a research assistant to help clarify tasks, even suggest journals that she might be able to submit her papers to. So there's a lot of potential benefit there, but the key words are appropriate use and replacing, um, not, not replacing, appropriate and assisting. But I think it's important to acknowledge that we don't really have much evidence yet of the value of AI in supporting student learning, uh, learning around those benefits. And so we need to be thinking about how we encourage their use um, critically. Um, but just wanted to explore one potential benefit and opportunity in a bit more detail. Um, there's a researcher in the UK called Professor David Nicholl. He's done some fantastic work around assessment design, around principle-led approaches to assessment. His latest field is around the value of inner feedback. So the value of students being able to, to provide some of that feedback process themselves. So it's not just the, 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 the teacher that's doing that for them. And he has a model, uh, which I think ChatGP and, Chat GPT and generative AI can fit really nicely into as a potential benefit. He asks students to do some work, firstly and importantly, and then um, asks them with a series of prompts to compare their work to other comparator resources. He then asks them to think about what they've learned from comparing that experience. So makes that 
a comparison experience, very much a learning experience. And then ask them to discuss with peers um, about that experience that they've had. And then finally gets to the teacher where they're asked to comment on that work as a result of that process, but in a very targeted way. So you can see the potential there for generative AI to be a really useful source of comparators. Um, and the, the potential benefit of that approach has already been evidenced in terms of the value for student learning. And the value of the process is not just to develop better work, it's to develop critical thinking. Um, and so just one example, really, of, of one of the ways that, that AI could be used critically in, and actively and not passively to really help students generate those really key skills of critical thinking. I think she pretty much said it. <laughs> yes, she said everything. <laughs> and I want to say saving time, saving time for the students because there's a lot of resources there and they have a lot of things to do. So if we can design the assessment with the AI to help them save time and focus on the things that they need to focus on and develop those skills, attributes, knowledge through our assessment design so they can actually learn things that they need to use later. And I go back to all the great examples that Lisa gave about feedback and uh, peer feedback and feedback from AI and learning through that. So I'm not going to add anything else except for saving the precious time. Well, now you've made me think that this is really a conversation. So not a series of people just talking into a microphone. But uh, to me, again, looking through my lens, my course is about helping students become better learners. And so they don't learn how to learn, just like, at least in the United States, I know Canada is much different. Um, <laughs> the, you, the instructors don't learn how to learn before they get in the classroom most of the time. Some go through programs and their postdoctoral work and all that. But students don't learn how to learn either. And so giving them these hooks, Hey, create yourself a study plan. Hey, create yourself a space repetition schedule, which AI generated tool or AI enabled tools like um, Quizlet or Study Blue. These flashcard apps have some of that built in. So it's like, hey, I'm going to automatically get a reminder to study now. Uh, Duolingo has got AI, AI backing and it helps students in an adaptive way. And so thinking about helping students intentionally become better learners, not being led by an AI bot instead of a human. They should be owning the learning process, giving themselves agency, but using the tool to support them in, in that process. Thanks. So the whole idea of um, developing learning capabilities sounds like an important area that AI can be a, a partner in. But what other digital capabilities do you think staff and students really require to be able to make appropriate use of um, portfolio pedagogies, practices, and research? And, and how does AI help to support that? So you've mentioned Quizlet and um, some of these different learning strategies tools that are out there. But what else will students need and, and faculty need as they just start to engage with AI? So another huge question. But I think for me, there's something really important. And we've talked already quite a lot about critical literacies, information literacies. But early on in my career, in the late 90s, we ran a, a JISC service which helped, uh, which developed a series of evaluation questions to help students understand what good looked like in relation to internet resources. And we're in a, a, a parallel time of change at the moment when those early, for those of you who can remember the early days of the internet, it was a bit of a wild west out there and it was really important to develop those, those, those critical skills to, to evaluate, you know, the wheat from the, the chaff, as we would say in the UK. Um, so there are many parallels here. Students need to, those critical literacies to frame the right questions, to be able to critique the outputs and, importantly, ethically use the outputs. Um, we had a, a webinar a little while ago from um, Stefan Popanici uh, from over in, in, in Australia, and he talked really eloquently about the need to teach students from a young age and shared with us that in Finland there was a program from primary school where student where students children were being taught those those key skills around, around how to work out what good looked like um, so we need to think about that 
And he also talked about stu developing students as expert prompt engineers. Um, but I think even more importantly, a, a researcher in the UK, Helen Beetham, was talking about that we need to go further to help students really interrogate the underlying business models, the underlying philosophies and practices around these AI tools so that they can really think deeply about where they're coming from and, and the processes around that. And just quickly, finally, but probably most importantly, I wanted to talk a bit about assessment literacy because we need students and staff to really understand what the purpose of assessment is and that it's not about writing an essay, that something that a tool like ChatGPT can sort out for them. It's about, it's about um, evidencing their ongoing learning. And once we can get to the bottom and the nub of that really vital question around what the point of it is, I really do hope that staff and students can understand why we're asking them to do different things that it's not just about testing them and something, practices that maybe they have been traditionally used to to date. And we often get a lot of critique in the UK around peer feedback. You know, what's the value? Why, why would a, somebody who's, a, who's my peer can give me feedback? It needs to be coming from my teacher. And it's because there's a fundamental misunderstanding about the value of those activities for their own learning. And they're going to be out there in the real world by themselves without tools to help them all the time. So, you know, let's make sure they're developing and understanding what they're developing. Can you share the example about your drawing? We were just chatting earlier about one of the fundamental reasons why this assessment space is so fascinating for me. And one of them was, a, um, I did a biology degree. Uh, I, had, I did an ecology module at the end of my degree. It was a vital point where I would, my degree classification, those grades would have really impacted on that. Uh, the guy who led it was a, a um, peat bog international peat bog expert and he was off in Borneo doing his peat bog stuff which was fantastic but not very accessible to students he set a pile of quite interesting assessments one of which was to draw an endangered species one of which was to do a scrapbook and I can't remember which one I did really badly on but I did badly on one of them and I thought I have no idea what was expected of me in that assessment task I have no idea whether my drawing was being assessed on my drawing capability, my selection of the creature that I was drawing, and yet that mark for me was absolutely critical. And, and I don't think things have often changed much in a lot of our students' experiences of assessment. So how can we engage them with the criteria about what good looks like and help them really understand that process? Thank you. And I asked her to tell you the story because I wanted to talk about the importance of assessment literacy and for the students and for the instructors. I work with a lot of instructors and we discuss their assessment. And it's important to know why, why you're doing this assessment and what are you assessing? What do you want your students to learn after they've left your course and they moved on and they graduated? What is this thing that you want them to, to, to know how to do? And this takes thinking and it takes reflection and it takes application and trying and getting feedback from your students and involving them, give, getting choice from them. So all of this assessment literacy is important. Whether you use AI or not, that's okay. But if you have it, if you understand why you're doing your assessment, then it becomes easier to decide how you want to use AI, if you want to use it and whether you're going to move on to another tool in two years. It makes me think about, um, you know, e-portfolios and AI and the question around what does meaningful learning actually look like and what kinds of skills and abilities do we need to develop in both the students and the instructors to get there? Because I think that's a, a question that we don't often think deeply about. So thank you for, for those great prompts to get us thinking about that. So, how are students responding to the use of AI and what can we do to support them with understanding the risks and the benefits for their own use? Kevin? So I, I asked my students, what are the pros and cons of using AI in higher education today? And they gave me pretty candid responses where they were excited by the capabilities, the adaptive uh, strategies that would help them improve their writing and help them um, get better in particular um, disciplines. They liked um, 
the use of bots because some students had to work. And when there's not a human to answer questions related to financial aid or something like that, um, they were excited that those AI bots would at least able to answer some of the questions. They were frustrated because the bots hadn't been well trained and that meant that usually in the chain of questions, it would say, please contact a human tomorrow. And so that defeats the purpose, right? But on the flip side, they were very um, worried, and you brought this up earlier as well, um, they don't like it when other students are gaming the system. They wanted students to be turning in original work and not basically um, cheating uh, compared to people who had put in the time to turn in original uh, effort. And they also didn't like the idea of instructors using AI to give them feedback and a grade. They said, we're paying tuition, tax dollars are paying for these instructors to do this work, I, we don't want AI to do it for them. And so there was a real pushback that surprised me, frankly, how many of the students had this type of thinking about AI itself. They loved the idea of it as a learning tool. Some of them were still exploring it, like many instructors today. It's not like every student, because they're on their phone all the time, knows about all every technology under the sun, but they did have a, a question about um, how it's being used. And maybe just to share a slightly different perspective on that too. Um, there's been a number of surveys which is, have been exploring student engagement with AI. And some of them show really high use. But we've I've seen two. One um, at the University College London, a recent survey, which showed um, only around a third of students, well, showed a third of students weren't currently using it. And that's echoed by the findings in, a, in some pebble pad research that we've been doing um, internationally across the US, Australia, and the UK, which was showing around 24% of students weren't using it. So there's perhaps an equity issue as well. If we see it as a beneficial tool, um, how do we ensure that stu all students have access to the tools? Um, the other side, the, as Kevin, you've mentioned, the, you know, report lots of reports around students' perspectives in terms of um, they are concerned around the inaccuracy and the bias and, uh, and around those perspectives that they don't want to see what a researcher in, our, in the UK calls a pandemic of cheating. You know, they have concerns around those. Um, so how do we support students around, around that? Um, I think we probably need a, a holistic multi-factor approach. Um, Philip Dawson from the Cradle Research uh, Group in uh, Deakin University talks about the Swiss cheese approach. You know, not one method is going to help students really grapple with these issues, but it's about helping them understand what academic integrity is, what appropriate use of AI is, um, and about assessment literacy and what the purpose of that is. So um, not one way is going to sort the problem. We need to be looking at it multi, uh, across multi-factors. Well, if we think about one way that we're all keen on, and that is portfolios, um, are there ways that portfolio assignments and assessments can counteract the negative side that sort of is bubbling up about AI and the fear maybe about AI? I would say yes, as I'm sure hopefully all of you will agree, absolutely. Um, and it's about how we how we take this conversation out to the wider community. Um, so this is my favorite topic. So um, firstly, I think we were agreeing earlier, students don't always set out to cheat, you know, so we have to explore why that is. Um, I think Professor Lee em uh, Emily Bender from the University of Washington talks about, you know, the problem, if there's a problem, um, if students t are turning to a fallback, the problem is upstream. So how can we look at our assessment design? How can we make sure that students are understanding why we're assessing them? Um, and then to get into the meat of it, I'll try to narrow it down, I think, to about six or seven factors. But we all know about this stuff. You know, portfolio practices enable the surfacing of the process. Um, there's Professor Rowena Harper, I think, at um, Edith Cowan University, who used portfolios extensively, talks very much about we need to move away from artifact-based assessment to, because she says we infer learning from these products. You know, we ask students to write an essay and we sort of infer that they're also developing these other skills that we want them to develop, but we're not explicit about it. So let's use more formative approaches, um, use more portfolio practices to make sure that we can directly see that process as it emerges. 
built in from the start, I think. Assessment sometimes is a bit of an afterthought, but you know, it really shouldn't be. It needs to be built in from the start so that engagement can happen. Um, and that touches on maybe factors four and five, which is about dialogic feedback. If you can see from the start what students are doing and you can engage with it, that the surface of their learning is being... So, uh, and, and Emily um, from Salt Lake Community College talked yesterday about better knowing your students. So if that process is much more visible, you're getting a much clearer sense of, of who they are, what they can do, so that you're not just seeing something at the end of it. With a focus on authentic tasks, we all believe in that very strongly. Um, and asking, as Shane was touching on earlier, about the application of knowledge in practice. So meaningful tasks that ask them to do something with the things that they know. Um, and that also maybe best help to prepare them for the ways that they'll continue to be assessed as they go through their future lives. And finally, my favourite example, opportunities for co-creation. And we heard yesterday some fantastic examples of co-creation from Emily, from uh, Simon. There's a, a great model in the UK uh, led by Edinburgh University who's been taken up by the University of Waterloo called the Slicks model. Um, some of you may have heard of it, but it's essentially a framework that allows any lecturer to take on, a, um, the, take on the framework. The students are asked to engage with the learning outcomes and make sense of them in their own context. So already they're starting to say, well, what does that mean for me? How am I going to evidence that? What does that look like? How can I reword them so that they make more sense to me? Um, and it started off because students, they wanted to develop students' research skills. How do you do that when not all students are having opportunities all the way through their, uh, their learning journey? So students are, are engaging with the criteria. They get to um, explore a project or an experience or something that is meaningful and relevant to them as part of an assessed credit-bearing outcome. And just such a fantastic example where they're developing student agency, critical thinking, higher order skills, originality of thought, all the things that we really want to be moving towards too. So I think I'll leave it on that note so that someone else can... Absolutely. Uh, and maybe just to sort of wrap that bit up, I think by doing all of these things, you are minimising the risk of, of cheating. You know, these are portfolio practices that we're all engaging with, you're, you're all doing amazing work in. Um, but it's just thinking about it in that way, in the context of the plagiarism challenge, I think. And if we can have that conversation with colleagues when they're concerned and worried about this whole AI thing, you know, we already have some fantastic ways of designing assessments that, that minimise that approach. So that's my call to action. Go out and multiply. <laughs> It's a really good call to action, I think, but also raises the issue of ethics. And so I'm just curious about the ethical implications that you all see for AI and, and potentially for, for AI and portfolios. So Eliana, maybe I can turn it over to you. Yes, so I was chatting with Kevin earlier about the ethical implications and he made a lot of interesting points. I'll let you talk about them later, but I wanted to talk about um, for me, the most important is preparing the students for an ethical use that goes beyond the tool right here, right now. So I can talk about now how you're going to use it and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But the most important, at least for me, is when you graduate, how are you going to use this? How are you going to represent your capabilities? How are you going to uh, know what you need to do and how you need to talk, how you need to assess uh, something that you are working on? For example, I gave you an example about um, an assessment for engineering students, for example. And let's say you want, to, for, you want them to go interview experts in the field. So one of the things that you need to develop is communication skills. And even if you use AI in creating these communications and creating those emails, even if my students are using AI, that's not the main point. The main point is why they're using AI to write these emails and what are they learning from this? So they could be, for example, like me, an international student or an English language learner 
not the first language. English is not the first language. So they can turn to AI to help them write this professional expected email that they need to send it out. But are they going to ask AI to write the email every time? Or every time they ask for that email, they're going to learn how to write that email. So by the end of the course or by the end of their degree, they know how to write a professional email. Uh, are they going to ask for the questions? And I go back to your point, if they ask for the questions or if they ask for help in the question, does the question still portray their voice? Does it still represent them? Or did the AI take the question, transform it into something that they wouldn't say? So what the ethical things for me here is, are they learning to use it well later? So they take the question from AI, does it still reflect their voice? Are they changing it? Are they reflecting on it? We can include a peer assessment there, a peer feedback or an assessment from the instructor, feedback from the instructor to think about those questions. And this is just a simple example. There's a lot there. Kevin, I'm going to turn it back to you because I know you have very important things to add. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you mentioned that one of the first things that... I, I think that the way that we can consider the ethical considerations and address them is to engage our students. The co-creation is not just in the artifacts, and the, but it's also the process and the learning process. And so if we talk to students and say, hey, if you're applying for a job and every applicant turns in a cover letter that's generated by AI, how is that person going to select between you and anybody else? You have all abdicated your voice to have some pool of data generate some mishmash and that uses all the right words from the job description, which is what you know we're trained to do, but we're at least thinking and writing it in our own words. And so having those conversations with students where the ethical consideration is, yes, you can use this to gain language proficiency as a scaffold, but do you want it to replace you? Do you and and I think and I I don't have the name of the person, but he said, basically, artificial intelligence is making everyone sound like a white dude. And so, and that's the truth, right? Because, and so that brings me to another one of the aspects of ethical consideration is the bias. The data that is consumed and used by AI chatbots to a large extent is dominant culture uh, created. And so I mentioned it yesterday. We have representatives from the Kwantlen First Nation here. I have a strong belief that there's probably no uh, contributions in that AI base that comes from that culture, right? And so what does that mean when someone from that First Nation wants to use this tool, but they're not represented? And so when we get into these ethical considerations, we need to let students know that it's a tool, but it is not the solution. And, and we have to figure out ways that we can imbue whatever it's generating, either a strategy or uh, a draft or something like that. How do we put the voice back in? How do we put our personality back in? The, the last couple of things real quick. Another ethical consideration is cost. Currently, I only use the chat GPT that's free because I know most of my students can't afford to pay the monthly fee for the one that costs money. And that means that it's slower, it's got less data in it, all these different factors. And so we're creating tiers of access and equity related to AI from the beginning. This is early stages in mass access to uh, AI, and it's, it's not a good model. Last but not least, the privacy considerations that some people have referenced during this conference are real, where turnitin.com has something that says you click I agree that my data, my essay will be used in order to check other people's work to see if it's uh, using the same language and all that stuff. The AI engine just soaks it all in and it becomes part of the pool and, and, and they don't uh, reference the work that they're basically using to generate the responses. So there's no attribution, there's a lack of privacy and security, uh, and your data is, you don't know what's gonna happen to it next. So having these conversations with students, it, 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 I refer everyone to the ABLE Digital Ethics Task Force and the principles that we came up with, because a lot of that information, a lot of these ideas are in those as well. And you can find that on able.com. <laughs> Just click the tab, uh, Digital Ethics Task Force. Um, but it makes me think also about, and maybe this is a, a, I don't know, this is a soapbox, but the notion 
from an ethical perspective of do no harm. You know, how do we set both students and faculty up to create contexts in which they're doing no harm to one another um, through the use of um, assessment strategies that they're engaging their students in? How do we enable them to design courses and to, to do the work that um, will do no harm? And I'm, I'm not sure that we're, I, I suspect in, in our community there's, there's lots of good work happening around that and how do we proliferate that work so that we're, we're having an impact on, on the rest of our colleagues. We have one final question, then we're going to turn it over to you for questions for the panelists. And that is, what is one thing you, uh, universities could do to support the use of AI in portfolio practices, pedagogies, and research? And I'm going to let you lead us off, Eliana. Yes, uh, this is one thing that I, I love talking about. And it's we need to provide opportunities for instructors to learn more about this. And these opportunities can take multiple forms and they 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 can like exist in multiple locations in multiple areas, could be different. So have this co-created conversation with the instructors to know what they need and to provide them with what they need and make it a, a, a conversation that keeps moving. It doesn't stop. It changes and it moves and it grows. So empower the instructors. It's like we almost prepared it because that was just uh, ties in really nicely that I think, you know, we've known for a long time about the issues with our assessment practices, but it's uh, really hard to do that in practice and really easy to sit up here and say, this is what good looks like. Why aren't you doing it? Um, because it's really hard and staff need that time and space to be able to really interrogate what they're doing and to think differently. And that requires resource um, from leadership and recognition that that needs to happen. So that would be my one thing, really. How can we enable and empower and how can we um, work with our leadership teams to so that they understand that this is something that's very important and is not specific to the AI challenge. So I would build on these two fantastic responses and say, do whatever you can to set everyone up for success, whether it be a faculty member for a student or a staff supporting either one. And so that could look like helping with the time conundrum by creating models of what a course that uses AI looks like. Because again, right now we're in reaction phase. Either people are afraid, I don't like this, I don't know anything about it, I'm afraid, I, I'm just not gonna do it. Or, and that's only one reason why people don't do it, others have uh, other reasons, but, but the other is, ooh, shiny object, I wanna use it. And so um, somewhere in the middle is a thoughtful, intentional response to, hey, this is a technology that has benefits and has uh, clear risks as well, and I'm going to have conversations with my students, and then at the upper level, the university can have conversations with the whole campus community to, to say, hey, let's get this out there so it's not everybody trying to figure it out on their own in the little time that they have, but instead, we're going to kind of facilitate conversations that hopefully trickle down into the work. And it sounds like portfolio practices and pedagogies are, are a really um, instrumental piece of how to have those conversations. So yeah, thank you. Um, we want to give you some time to ask questions or make a uh, question about in terms of what you were just talking about, Kevin. So I've been on the front lines of doing AI workshops, specific workshops with multiple departments in our institution and I've also been asked in to talk to senior leadership about AI and what it is and, what, and so we're kind of in this situation now where yeah I 100% agree that in an ideal world instructors are helping to improve students uh, AI digital literacy using it ethically using it critically etc but what I'm finding when, when I go in and do these workshops is that you know we're dealing with a huge digital literacy issue in faculty. And we've also had the response from senior leadership 
that you know our, our faculty have a lot of autonomy so they don't they're not going to put out an ai policy or guidelines or anything which i i understand I, different departments i mean obviously marketing something like that those students are going to be using it they really need to use it while they're students but we're talking about nursing there's real issues with privacy and the kind of things they might put into um, generative ai and work with it you know you want to be really cautious so i guess if, does anyone have any thoughts on how, if, you, if you're kind of, if, if that's where the institution is situated and you are in a situation where, you know, you are sort of doing faculty support, do you have any ideas about how that can be approached, like to try and help faculty get it on their radar, improve their literacy, et cetera? Uh, I'm going to give you an example from a research that we just conducted, and I hope that's useful for you. We, um, we checked with 18 institutions that were able to sustain their reimagined assessment after COVID. So we wanted to see these people who were successful in keeping their uh, new assessments or innovative assessments going after. And um, what, two things that we noticed, I think they relate to your work. Uh, the first one was uh, when it, it was left to the, each faculty or department to determine what quality assessment is. And here I say also determine what quality AI assessment is. And I think you referenced this with, with the difference between nursing and other faculty. So each one is doing something that is meaningful to them and that makes sense to them in the use of AI. So giving them that space is important. So I think that's a good practice. And the second one is... Uh, is is I forgot what it is. I am sorry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but it is there. It might come back anyway. <laughs> yeah. So uh, providing that space for the empowering the faculty. Yes. So empowering them to come up with their own ideas. So m my approach would be if I'm going around and talking when I'm going around and talking about assessment, is I tell people that you are the experts, and I trust that you're going to do the best decision for your students and for your faculty. And let's work together. So bringing them in as partners and then doing something together. So I help them reflect on their ideas. I hope that's useful to your... Yes. But that is the departments who are, who are putting up their hand and saying, can you come help us? Oh, okay. We have a lot of departments who are not approaching us. So I guess that was more my question. How do we reach the people that are not reaching out? Yes, Lisa. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure it's going to help. I was just I heard about a really lovely example at Flinders University where they're um, using a traffic light model approach. So, you know, encouraging all their faculty to think about, okay, so if it's green, yeah, you know, use ethically. If it's amber, mm, and then if it's red, no. So it's about working out sort of where um, AI practices uh, are going to fit in that scenario. Um, but how you engage other faculty who don't even know they need to be engaged yet, mm. <laughs> it's a harder issue. The other thing to consider is it's early days, right? And so uh, if you're familiar with Roger's adoption curve, you need those early adopters to show what it looks like so that the early majority can say, OK, they've gone through the pain and trouble of figuring this thing out. Now I can at least follow their lead. It's that over the hump, over the middle point, the late majority not only need to see other people succeed, but they also need a lot more support. And so whether it's a lack of awareness or a lack of um, readiness or what have you, that last group is going to take more time and it's going to take more socialization and visibility. And so really, I would say invest the effort in making those early adopters and early majority more successful so that that can be a spotlight, so that they can provide peer feedback to others. The last thing I would say is to point out where they may not be aware that AI is in their field. So you brought up nursing. Uh, yesterday, the, one of the examples I gave is that in the healthcare industry, and it's it's something that I think would be a great critical thinking exercise for nurses or nurses to be. The fact that AI is being used to generate diagnoses based on comparing, let's say, an X-ray to X-rays that have been captured and stored in some database or uh, pictures of cells in a microscope compared to cells elsewhere. And, and can we trust that AI can make as good a judgment as 
a doctor, as a nurse, as a... So having that be part of the conversation too, so it's not like, well, I can't imagine AI. I mean, we yeah, privacy and all those things, yeah, don't, don't use it for X, Y, and Z, but be aware that it's being used in your field and here's how you can build it into the learning process so that when they get someplace, they're competing with students who are aware that this is going on and have studied or at least practiced. And I think just to add on to that, making visible the work that you are doing with those early adopters, telling those stories so that others can see themselves and get examples and be engaged. I think that's something that is often a challenge for us. We do all this really great work, but it happens a little bit behind sort of four walls, right? It's closed in, and so the more we can tell stories about the work that we're doing, maybe create portfolios of, of all the approaches that are being used on a campus would be a way to really leverage our practices in service of helping others to do the work. Um, I think we have time for another question or two or comment, if anyone would like to make one. I was going to suggest for Susan that um, maybe getting those folks in a room together to collaborate, like you talk about the collaboration piece, and saying we're going to create a case study for healthcare together, and then critically analyze what has been produced by the generative AI, and it's going to miss the cultural pieces, the socioeconomic pieces, all the human pieces that are involved, um, and let them do it together as the faculty without the students, so that now there's a safety net, we see what it looks like, and now we're going to feel more free to do that with our students. Arm's not quite long enough. Um, we, we actually recently had an interesting um, innovation, one of our instructors who teaches sociology, she teaches a society and technology class, decided to reshape her entire class this semester around generative AI. Um, and uh, it was very interesting to talk to the students and to let them experiment. I, I went in as a guest speaker to show them KPU's approach to this. Um, and I would say more than a third of the students had not created any accounts. There was some fear pieces there. There was there was definitely not the adoption that instructors assume is there behind the scenes. Um, but as we talked about bias and ethics and all of those pieces, their final project, which I'm yet to see in the next couple of weeks, um, was to create something to either educate other students, to write a position paper, to... Uh, the institution about what they'd like our approach to be or something for the government or to take anything about what they'd learned in that and move it forward in some way. And so some of those students who felt comfortable in an AI space are using it. The assignment guidelines said it was the student's choice, but they had to submit and clearly identify what was their work and what was the uh, what was generated by chat GPT or whatever tool they used. Um, and the students who didn't want to use it didn't have to, but could still engage. So quite UDL in nature, lots of choice space in there, um, and a really creative way to kind of tread carefully into a space, even though the instructor herself was super fearful. Like, I have no idea what I'm going to find. I have no idea how any of this is going to go, but I'm going to take a leap and we'll figure it out. Other questions or comments? Oh, yeah. Thank you all so much for this panel. One of my big takeaways from the conference has actually come from the Salt Lake City community folks and, and just the role that I think student voices need to play in the decisions that we make. And so what role would you all like to see students play in how we think about how to use AI effectively in education? Maybe just start off by saying I think um, Leanne and other colleagues talking about collaboration is absolutely critical uh, and the fact that it's early days. So we're not, no individual is going to have the solution to these problems. So the more we can support faculty to engage with other staff roles in the library and in learning design and, and the student voice to collectively work through the issues. Um, and I heard a quote recently, and I'm not going to get it all right, but I think it was from some uh, Paolo Freire that you quoted earlier, talking about, um, it's all about hopeful, rest, uh, hopeful and restless inquiry. And it was just about the fact that we're learning on this learning journey together, and the more that we can include the student 
voice within that learning journey and hopefully enable and empower staff that they don't feel they need to have all the answers at the moment, that this is a journey that they're learning together. And that's the perspective that this lecturer who I was um, reading about at the uh, University of Manchester was coming from. She was exploring that space with her students and they were very much part of the journey that they were going on together. And we shouldn't be afraid of, of, of doing that. Another thing is to put students in the limelight. So I love how Pima Community College in Arizona had a panel like this with the president of the community college, a student, and a faculty member. And the student started and had created a AI-generated video clip using the picture of the president and recorded speeches so that uh, the voice would basically be generated and basically said, Hello, you may not realize this, but I am not the president of Pima Community College. And, and then, you know, then went on to share how he was using it. And I brought up this example for those who weren't there yesterday. The student basically had to come up with uh, an understanding of the laws of thermodynamics. And so he asked ChatGPT to s explain it to him as if he were a 10-year-old then explain it to him as if he were a 20-year-old, and then explain it to him as if he were a 30-year-old, so that he could basically scaffold the learning about a very complex concept for himself. And so that type of example is what we need to spotlight so that students can see ways to use artificial intelligence for their, for their benefit. Um, and I loved the president's reactions, like, how do you follow that? Like, I, you know, he, he made a video clip of me talking, and it's not me, and I'm scared now. And so, but, but I think that's that sense of playfulness and that sense of, like, hey, let's explore this together when we have those conversations and facilitate them at the campus level, including students in, the, in that conversation is critical. I'm going to take it to the extreme and say students as partners. And when I say partners, it's a continuum, of course, and there's multiple things that we can do with our students. It also comes with the responsibility of giving them literacy so they can make informed decisions. So all of, the, all of what was mentioned, in addition, students as partners, we're, we're not doing this to them. We're doing it with them. We are teaching with them. We are assessing with them. So let's get them on board and help them get empowered, ask them what they think they want to use, how they want to use it, what is a good idea of using it, what is useful to them, what is not useful, and then take it from there. And just to add to that, um, if you're interested in more detail on that, what that can look like and different models of that, the UK, um, just we have quite a large program around students as partners. Yes, I saw that. change agents, and there's a journal that comes out monthly, um, I think, which is all about how to engage students as partners and just not as, uh, you know, getting student voice in. It's about embedding them as part of that process. So I'd highly recommend that, that work if you're looking at detail. Well, I just want to make sure I keep us on time. And uh, so I'm going to leave it there. But um, please Feel free to follow up with Kevin, Lisa, or Eliana. And I just want to say thank you so much for bringing these different perspectives to us at the end of a, of a conference and uh, giving us lots of food for thought to take away. So thank you all so much.